It's an odd shape. Balanced on three legs, made of wood, cast iron, brass, felt, ivory. How can it make such magic, create such feelings day after day, year after year? A good piano can last a lifetime and more. It can be passed on to future generations. This is a story in three parts, about what one person gave away, what another person won, and how a small group of artisans gave new life to something old. A graduate of the music department at the University of California at Berkeley, Leon McGowan was interested in music from an early age. In her youth, she became a serious student of piano and gave recitals. In later life, she taught piano, free of charge, to children. Leon Squires McGowan. She left various bequests to UC Berkeley in her will, but the strangest and in some ways the most wonderful is the bequest of her Steinway. Okay, well, there it is. All right, let's see what we have. There were two conditions to the gift. First, the instrument was not to be given to the university, but to be held by them for a worthy student of piano. And second, the piano needed work, a great deal of work. Serial number 257,000, which makes it uh, built in New York in 1927. Mm. A good year. We wondered in the music department for a long time how to decide on who was going to get it. We could, of course, just have had a faculty meeting and said, well, so-and-so will get it. But we thought that this was not equitable and that the only real way was for the winner to win it, to win it in a competition and to be seen to have won it and heard to have won it. And so a competition was announced and the practicing began in earnest. Within a few weeks, 46 contestants had been winnowed down to a few finalists, competing in one night on the nine-foot Steinway of Hertz Hall. restoration that we're doing here, which is very time-consuming and, and very expensive, we're looking for an instrument that will give back musically all the time and money we put in, and it will also have the value to support that investment. brings us back down to a very small percentage of pianos, probably 95% of the pianos in the world have been eliminated by this criteria. So we're left with the truly world-class instruments, Steinway, Mason and Hamlin, Bersendorfer, Beckstein, and a handful of others. Those are the pianos that really, I would consider world-class instruments from which we can get a world-class result. Hey you guys, we got a new piano in the shop, the McGowan M. The crew at Callahan Piano is a small, diverse group who can read a piano and its problems almost immediately. A sluggish action, for instance, indicates verdigree, the corrosion that builds on the brass parts over time. Yeah. 
did drive like there we go. Or in case. Yeah. In, the, in the other room. Let's get it out of here because we're kind of. Well, but they, 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 these aren't 1920s knuckles. Yeah, they went from the side. That is weird. It looks all original to me except the hammers. Okay. One of those. Could be. New hammers on old shanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, on old shanks. Well, it hasn't been messed with too much, which is good. The board looks really good. This is a, you know, it's a Berkeley since new, most likely, as far as we know. It's beautiful. So yeah, the board and bridges look really nice. It's good. Fixed. Two fifty-one and a half. Yeah, that's Piano's a living thing, and it, every time, every time the hammer strikes the string, there's a imperceptible change to it. Just like every time our heart beats, there's some imperceptible change in our systems. The greatest technician in the world and the greatest pianist can't get something out of a piano that's not in there, um, and that's why. The celebrated makes are what they are because, like the great growths in France and wine, um, they have a long track record of, of, of beauty and character. And uh, it's not that other pianos can't be just as beautiful. It's just that you know, when it says time on it, you you have a certain a certain standard and a certain range that you have a right to expect from it and are likely to receive. Oh wow! <clears throat> Easy as can be. Oh, it looks not too bad. Oh man, feel how tight those are? It's tight. Very tight. See that? Those should be nice and free. Yeah, that's a new back action. We're going to have to replace that. We can have uh, between two and four hundred labor hours into one restoration. The fact is that's more hours than the manufacturer spent actually building the piano in the first place. Repetition. Rebuilding a piano is <laughs> it's very time-consuming and tedious. You know, there's 88 of everything, and you have to do everything 88 times. And there's a lot of repetition here, but um, slowly the instrument emerges, and at the end, you really can have something very, very special. First work is weighing and measuring what you have, establishing starting points. Some weights are hairline critical. A thump on the bench is just enough to break the friction. If the key went down without this, the weight would be too much. The Callahan shop standard of quality requires every part of every piano to be no more or no less than one-tenth of a gram different from its fellow parts. I think that, oddly enough, that, that the fact that I'm essentially a blues and boogie p piano player means that you know, if I'm going to sit down and check out a piano to see what I think of it, Instead of being locked into a piece of music where, you know, some guys will sit down and, and like, oh, I do this piece, and it's, you know, it's like maybe got a three octave range. You know, I'll play every note on the piano, just, you know, why not? You know, you can, you can do anything. So I can get a better sense, I think, for myself of the different sections of the piano and how they're all working together.
close to Kita, so we want to save this old ugly. Yeah. So we'll wait on that. But what did you find out about that? It's pretty standard for these, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's an awful lot of verdigris, you can see, you know, there's a lot of friction. So, uh, and the hammers are, are heavy, they, they're replacement hammers and they're way heavier than the original, so it wasn't planned too well. We but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty par for the course, except the R number, the overall leverage is pretty high, it's uh, six, eight. Ouch. Yeah, that's real high. Q ratio is five, two, you know, we might be able to roll the uh, capstan line forward a little bit. But the capstans they're already are angled. already angled. Yeah. yeah. But they're they're hitting pretty well at the center of the heel. So you know I might be able to bring it up a millimeter or two and get it down to a 5-0. Okay. Well that's just Yeah if the uh, you know the action frame's good. I don't know that till we get the parts off. Alright, well that's the next step. Mm-hmm. Some decisions about what to replace are difficult to make, and some are not. During work inside, the fine veneer finish of the piano case constantly has to be protected from scratches and bruises. A soundboard looks flat to the uneducated eye, but it has to have exactly the right amount of curvature to give full power to the voice of the piano. A few bubbles, but not bad. Much of the work is done with chisels and hammers and files, but some is also done with tools like tiny glass beads. Thousands of them are fired at the verdigris that has accumulated over the years, and within hours, the brass is like new. When I started working here, I started attending the Piano Technician Guild meetings in San Francisco. And there's a part of the meetings where they ask technical, if anyone has technical questions. I always came in with some doozies, I think, just 
everyone's kind of groaning, like, oh, no, you know, and he kind of, I think he took pity on me. It's like, all right, <laughs> offer me a job, call me up, offer me a job. Most of it is just learning from someone who knows it, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's very gratifying work, especially I do a lot of what we call the finishing, the final regulation and voicing. Actually, it's synergistic with the, the, all the technicians working on one piano. I think we turned out a better rebuilt piano than if each one of us were rebuilding it. And you think about it, all the work we do, all the, all the work on the, the soundboard and the bridges and the action and everything, Actually, what we're really doing is wanting to all disappear so that when the pianist plays, it's just his or her musical imagination coming out directly. And that has happened. The players have said the piano disappears. The whole piano is built around the hammer weight. Because the mass of the hammer and its velocity is how the energy is transmitted into the soundboard. The energy comes from the weight of the hammer. And if you think about this as a starting point for building a piano, it's just a way of thinking that I think has great validity. And in my designing of action designs, touch weight designs, we start with the hammer weight and we build the action around that hammer weight. And when you start to dissect a piano and look, for instance, at each key, and measure the effect of each lead weight, we see that pianos with perfectly even down weights have uneven key weights and uneven hammer weights. And for this reason, pianos, some pianos feel more even than others almost by, just by accident. So what I developed was a system where we take apart the action and individually weigh each component and measure its effect and look at it on a graph. But with computers, suddenly I could start looking at measurements from piano to piano to piano, measuring all these components. And everyone was different. And I was slowly, bit by bit, I started to understand the relationships. And bit by bit, the relationships revealed themselves to me as an algebraic expression. And it's what I call the equation of balance. The equation of balance is a fundamental, um, I guess you'd call it an algorithm, which explains the weight leverage characteristics of piano action. Steve and I were to the point where we were rebuilding Steinways on a pretty regular basis. We had a good reputation, but like most technicians, we were getting inconsistent results. We would finish a piano and it would play like a dream and we'd think we were geniuses, and then we'd finish another one and it would play like a truck and we say, uh-oh, what went wrong? So we were searching for answers, and David Stanwood at that time was already starting to give classes and publish articles about his work, which is all about balancing the action to a higher level than has been done previously. And I think like most technicians, both Steve and I read the articles, looked at what he was doing, and thought he was nuts. <laughs> Once that equation came to light, suddenly it was possible to create a predictable feel and response in the action. And when a customer is paying a lot of money for a piano, we want to be able to say, yes, we can give you a light action or, or an action that you can play and control the sound, or a big sound, or a mellow sound. Or... And we did our first job using Stanwood's basic basic principles and the result was pretty remarkable and to prove to ourselves that it wasn't a fluke we did another one and then we did another one and suddenly we were getting very consistent results exactly the way we wanted them
Out of necessity, many of the tasks are repetitious. There's a lot of taking out and putting back and taking out again. Sunlight there, we go perfect. And from this side, it looks pretty good. What do you think? Is it too flat? It seems flat, but I don't know. Go ahead, do it again. Dead flat, yeah. But you have just about the perfect amount of back bearing there. I didn't. Here we go. Jar. Mm -hmm. Touched it last time we did one of these. In a few minutes, Steve. Um, I'll have you take over. You know, a lot of people think that that, that that's part of what playing the piano is, is that it's a struggle to, to bring out uh, the music. But that's not, it's not really true. You know, it, I, I, think, I, think, I think having a, like having a really sharp knife, you don't have to saw at it, you know, it just cuts. And I think that's the same way with the piano. I mean, you should be, you should be able to predict how much effort it takes to, to, to draw the tone that you want, and it should be even from top to bottom. I'm currently a piano technician apprentice. Before that, I was a business analyst. But I originally trained as an x-ray technician. Actually, I spent a year in the College of Architecture first before I switched to music. Before that, I was a massage therapist. I was hauling an upright piano around to, to gigs, you know, playing, and it was learn how to tune it or, uh, or play an out-of-tune piano every night, I guess. Before that, I was an arts administrator. I thought I was going to go in studying 20th century avant-garde music and came out studying Gregorian chant. Yeah, restoration as well as cabinet making and building and Pretty much anything wood and kind of done. Well, I worked in a few garages <laughs> for people doing piano work. Before that, I was uh, kind of doing things with my master's degree in German, so I was doing working for a translation company, and I was also writing parts of high school textbooks. So, but I mean the group of people I work with is just uh, amazing. Yeah. Smart, funny, unusual, creative, irreverent. <laughs> Everyone has a sideline. Rachel, for instance, gives haircuts to her fellow workers and charges them an outrageous price. A dozen ice cream bars, which she shares immediately. Decide if we could open a shop with it. They'd each put in $500 or something. And we rented a garage <laughs> and, and bought a piano someplace and put it in there and fixed it up. And uh, that's the way it started. And we're still lurching along. Not that I'm in it anymore. <clears throat> I'm out. I'm theor theoretically retired and living on my accumulated wealth. <laughs>
Now, for the real fun. Okay, so, get the thing ready. And, you know, you gotta keep it flush against the stretcher. Yeah, try not to do that. One of the difficulties of restoring fine pianos is that they are built very, very solidly. This pin block was glued and doweled on three sides. The one yesterday just popped loose right about now. <laughs> So you can see it's it's loose up here now. Right. All right. <laughs> like, this thing just doesn't want to quite come. Yeah. There, it, there goes. it is. Finally hit the spot. And we're out. Everybody here is really excited about being here, which is kind of rare. But everybody here is like, wow, how can I be doing this better? So it's really nice to get caught up in that tide, because I'm definitely wide-eyed. Wow, never seen that before. <laughs> then you cut the, the back and the sides off to fit the piano, and that's okay. when the index holes are useful. Uh, index holes. Because okay. it, it tells you where, where that cut's going to be. Steve Willis. My first employee and practically my partner in this business um, taught me early on that um, trying to force people to work a certain amount of time, a certain amount of hours per month, per week, I uh, wasn't going to work with him and I wasn't going to get my best work out of him that way because he's a musician. He plays, he plays music at night, he has rehearsals, he, he tours with different bands. So we've sort of kept that uh, ethic <laughs> throughout with every employee. Some of them are pretty surprised when they find out, oh, I don't have to show up at nine and leave at five. Um, and we say, no, it's, uh, it's pretty much, you know, come and work when you want. We, you know, we're, we're a serious business and we, we get a lot of work done here, but it seems to work better for people if they're not as structured as a factory. And we're not a piano factory here. And these people are creative people. They all have something that they're passionate about. It's not necessarily piano work. And it seems if we give them the freedom to follow their passion, and they're passionate when they do come to work. Well, I learned to tune by ear, and I tuned by ear for um, the first 10 years of my tuning career, 35 years now. Um, and I had a bias against these machines as well. I thought, well, this must be used by somebody who doesn't really know how to tune a piano by ear. And then I tried one. And then my tuning got better. And I don't rely on the, the machine strictly for um, telling me what to do. I use it as a third um, or a second sense. I'm using my hearing primarily, but now I have a visual display as well. So it gives me more information about what I'm hearing. Not only does the work on one piano have to stay well organized, each piano in the shop needs separate storage and workspace. A grand piano has over 6,000 parts and the hammers and strings for each of the 88 notes must be kept in strict order because their sizes and weights change up and down the keyboard.
Drilling something as crucial as a new pin block leaves no room for error. It is home base for each set of strings. One pin a fraction off makes it unusable. From here on, this is all singles. We use the D diameters. We get, we're going to use four bits. And then the rest of these, it's E. And then go F for this section, the temperament section. Mm -hmm. And then G, the rest of the way. I'm the, the designated uh, go-to guy uh, when we have an apprentice in the shop or uh, somebody who's got basic skills, really, you know, like cabinet makers who want to expand or people who've done some musical instrument work who want to learn more. And I go back later with like an eighth inch bit. Like it's really, really especially gratifying to pass it along to somebody who's almost as obsessed uh, now as I was at that age. So. Uh, I got all your stuff here, by the way. I got the, uh, um, the brace here for the, uh, the webbing screws. And I got the right sizes of sockets for the perimeter legs. A shop like this has to have an engine hoist. Cast iron plates can weigh as much as 600 pounds. Right. You know, Steve Willis and I are the same age and came up doing the same thing at the same time, learning how to rebuild pianos. Eyeballs. We're largely self-taught. We made every mistake, and now we know what we're doing because we made all those mistakes. Uh, two things to watch is this thing coming into its mortise and these two nose bolts where they come in here. So let's get. This is looking good. If you sit around at John's shop long enough, you see that these are people who really care about doing something right. There we go. Perfect. Ready? Okay. Lovely. And what's most interesting is that John, when he was reading this one section in the book about Gould's extreme unhappiness, with Steinway pianos the first time, because I had this stack of letters from Gould that I showed to John, the first time John read it, he, I kid you not, nearly burst into tears. And he said, I cannot believe this. If only Gould were alive today and he could see what we can do with a piano, he wouldn't have had this kind of terrible frustration. All through the process, new parts arrive each month, the best available to match or improve upon the originals. One might think that a piano could be made up, quite simply, of keys you pushed down, which made hammers go up and hit strings of different lengths. Does it need to be any more complicated than that? Yes, it does. Too complicated to fully explain here. A couple of aspects of it are worth noting, however. First, all the levers and shafts do not make the hammer actually hit the string. If they did, the sound would be a clunk, not a musical tone. No, they propel the hammer almost all the way, and then, just before impact, they drop away. The hammer has to continue on its own momentum, hit the string, and bounce off. Only a free collision can make music. 
Second, the other reason for the complexity of the action is to allow very fast repetitions, trills, blinding speed runs. A good piano should always be ready for the next note, even if it's only a split second away. No pianist should ever have to wait for a key to be ready to strike again. Going around the hitch pins and back to the tuning pins, the strings of a piano, once tightened fully, contain over 36,000 pounds of tension. piano and the whole piano vibrates, you know, it's, it's a big, massive wooden construction and all the wires vibrate to some extent, damped or not. And, and there's a feeling with a good piano that the, you're not so much playing the piano as you're collaborating with it. The piano plays you back. In the regulation stage of work, each of the 88 notes requires attention to more than 25 issues, including key height and leveling, correct hammer travel distance, proper tension on all springs, and friction on moving parts. A separate set of tools is needed for all of these adjustments. As the restoration nears completion, the finish of the piano case finally receives its share of attention. Well, you need to be patient about things, I think. You gotta be thorough. You have to get one step done very well before you move on to the next step. That's probably the case in most jobs, but if you if you uh, let things go earlier on, you end up paying for it on the tail end. close enough. Now we'll listen to how it sounds. And we know that all three, three wires aren't being struck at the same time. Okay. So with this little specialized sanding block, you can sand all three grooves if you should want to. Or you can sand two thirds of the hammer from either side, of course. Or a single wire groove, or you can also do just the center wire. Let's see if we're flat yet. Yeah. 
very close, just a little more. Part of what we're doing here is bringing the piano back to life, but we're also <clears throat> finding that each piano is different for some reason, and each one has its own voice, so you gradually uncover the voice that's in that piano. First, the hammers must be very carefully shaped in order to hit all three strings at the same instant. Then the hardness of the hammer has to be softened in certain key areas of the felt with single or multiple needles. A skilled voicer can make possible a beautiful bloom of sound with a wide range of color, very slightly adjusting his treatment of each hammer as he works up and down the keyboard. I really do feel like every piano has its own individual personality and soul, and sometimes that soul is very well hidden <laughs> by a lot of problems in the piano. And what they do is they get rid of all of those so that the, the, the piano lives and breathes again. And it's a, it's a really remarkable thing when you play an instrument like that, who, that that just feels alive and responsive. This huge, uh, maybe it was cherry wood, Lewis and French, Lewis and French upright piano, and it's the kind that if you just brushed it, just the edge of the of a pedestal, you might break your little toe. <laughs> and it was that hard. And my my aunt, my mother, her, my mother's father, my grandfather Hall also played that piano. With this fantastic new action, the Stanwood system, not only do the keys come back up as fast as you want, but they can go down as slowly as you want, and you can still get a tone. And this means that you can get incredible pianissimos. Now, I guess for most people, you think, well, the greater the piano, the louder it is. The longer the piano, the louder it can be. And I suppose there's truth in that, but really, the better the piano, the softer it can be. Lesser pianos, you just can't get pianissimos. It's not possible. You put the, your hand down, your finger down slowly, and there's nothing. There's no sound. So you have to play loud. And so with a piano like this, you can have an incredible dynamic range, which um, makes it more interesting to listen to and certainly more interesting to play. <laughs> about finished, John said, it's, it's almost done. It's gonna come home soon. I said, well, we have to have a party for those guys. And I thought, well, that's great. We'll deliver the piano home. We can have a party. We'll bring all the guys to their house. And Linda said, no, no, no. We want to do it here in the shop. I started getting more involved after the Brooks came up with the idea to do these piano parties. So that got me down there once every few months. Karen and I would pack up the food and the dishes and come down and throw a party. And so the first party for a piano was born and my guys really enjoyed it too because after spending a year bringing that piano back from the dead basically, they were able to celebrate right there with the people who were gonna be playing the piano. And the musicians make the party. The music is always wonderful. And even if the, uh, if the customer is not a pianist, there's always plenty of pianists. And so, it is reborn. Unassuming, ready for anything, and likely to last another 80 years.
Hello, everybody. May I have your attention, please? So we had a competition, and it was a very, very nice event. But when we got to the final with the six really wonderful players who played, that's where the five members of the jury who did the judging had a very difficult task in selecting the, the best player. And the prize winner is Jared Redman. You know, just the, the nerves of going on stage in general are always, it's always very difficult. And you're going, you're sitting there for hours in your gloves and maybe you're playing the hard passage on your knee, trying to keep your fingers moving. Because in it, nervousness makes your circulation go bad so your hands are cold or whatever. I mean, knowing that the prize is such a, is such a big deal, that's also an added... Whether it's a pressure or a sense of excitement, I guess it just depends on the person, you know. Actually, it's, it's probably harder waiting after the competition. You have to watch your competition and sit there for hours. That's probably the harder part, actually, than actually playing. Before the piano speaks again, after having been silent for so long, I'd like us all not only to raise our glasses to Jared, but long life to the piano, and thank you, Callahan Pianos. So I'm going to play two short etudes by Scriabin. And if you know them, that's great. And if you don't know them, then you should get to know them better. <laughs> without the musician, without the owner sitting there and responding. And uh, it's very gratifying when they sit down and love it. That's the best part. New York, uh, where Cornell is, to study privately with Stephen Stuckey, who some of you may know. He's a composer there, a pretty eminent one. I'm taking the piano along with me. I have plans for other piano things in the future. Uh, it's, I, would, I could hardly ever uh, abandon this at all. I prefer to think of myself as doing both, writing music and playing other people's music. So uh, this is going to be my best friend for the next couple of years, and I'm very, very happy with it. So thank you. The new owner of the piano is not the only person who gets to perform at a Callahan party. I don't know, we've, we've turned out an awful lot of good pianos, you know. There's, some, there's been some really remarkable pianos, and when it comes out nice, you kind of pat yourself on the back and feel good about things. <laughs> John always stands us up and 
says we're the ones who did the work. How do you measure satisfaction with a life's work? A lot of it is how your work lives in other people. All that, experienced with old and new friends, good food and drink, makes for an evening very well spent. Great place to be. It's you know, just during winter time. I get the end of the day, and I just like we all sometimes would just walk over and stare, <laughs> stare out the window at the San Francisco skyline and the sunset. You never get tired of it. No, this is a wonderful business that I can um, hopefully keep going. I can't. I can't imagine rebuilding a piano at age uh, seventy, but I can imagine having a party for a piano at age seventy. <laughs> Does a piano miss the touch of human hands? Does it wait for the chance to surge again with sound? Does it go to a new home with anticipation? Don't be silly. It is just an odd box, balanced on three legs, made of wood, cast iron, brass, felt, ivory. A complex creation of human minds, hearts, and hands. A miracle in a box. I asked you be mine for life. I beg you, please, to be my wife. I drown myself. Next to me.